Welcome to Know Alive Alaska. My name is Lisa Hiruki Raring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This webinar series is designed to help you get to know NOAA's work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at different career paths you might be interested in. Today, we're introducing you to Joshua Russell, who works for NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Juneau, Alaska. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial Indigenous knowledge and much to share with us. In Alaska, Josh's work is conducted throughout Southeast Alaska, which includes the traditional homelands and waters of the Aleutic, Sugpiak, Iyak, Tinkit, Haida, and Sumshin. We are honored to acknowledge that, that Josh is presenting from Juneau, Alaska, the ancestral land of the Tlingit, who have stewarded this, stewarded this land for thousands of years. The community thrives thanks to their continued sharing of vision, wisdom, values, and leadership. We would also like to acknowledge that we're hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the First People of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our pre presenter. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write questions and we encourage you to ask questions as we go along. My colleague Chris Beyer and I will be keeping track of questions for Josh behind the scenes. He'll stop every now and again and answer a few questions. We might not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'll hand it over to Josh to introduce himself. Thank you, Lisa, I appreciate that. Um, my name is Joshua Russell. I'm a fisheries biologist with NOAA Fisheries at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. I am based in Juneau. I've been working for NOAA and different capacities for about the last uh, eight years, but I've been a full-time employee with them for this last year. And today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about to see what you guys know about Alaska salmon. Maybe I can teach you a few things. And then to explore what the job of a salmon biologist, biologist is, what I do, um, how I got to where I am, and what the future looks like for me. To jump right in, today's topics, I want to break into four sections. In between each section, I'll be a chance for uh, questions from you guys. I was told this talk was for mainly elementary age and middle school kids, so I'll try to tailor it towards the, at that level. Um, first subject is how I became a fish biologist, um, what led me to this path that I'm on, um, how I got here, schooling, things like that. Then we'll take some time to talk about salmon life cycle, um, the different key things that are important about salmon, um, what's unique about them, and what their different seven life stages look like. We'll jump into what is a weir. If you're not familiar with that, um, what it does, what it's used for, and I work at a weir on a daily basis, so we'll go a little bit into what my daily life is like and what I do as a you know, a biologist. And then we'll finish up with a little bit about Alaska salmon management and stewardship, focusing on those who are potentially in Alaska, things that you can do, and those are that are in the Pacific Northwest as well, to help be more knowledgeable about salmon management and to be good stewards of that resource. Jumping right in, I want to talk to you about how I became a fisheries biologist. What led from the picture you see on the right, which was me with my first salmon catch in Alaska way back when, to the picture now on the left, which is me before work, after work, whenever I get a free chance going out fishing, um, exploring the passion that I have for fisheries. The first thing that completely changed my path was a completely random experience that I had in Uktiakvik, or what is formerly known as Barrow, which is a city that is as far north in the state of Alaska as you can go. Um, I was living there at the time due to my dad's work. I was in middle school and the native peoples up there have the ability to harvest bowhead whales for uh, subsistence use. So they'd harvest whales and then use that meat for food over the winter or the summer for the culture. And I was offered the opportunity to go out and see what a harvest looked like. Um, as a kid in middle school, that was something completely new and foreign to me. So I jumped at the opportunity. And at the time for me, I was, my dad was an engineer. I was pretty good at math. So I thought engineering was the path for me, but little did I know this was gonna completely change that. 
So I got to go out and experience what the harvest looked like, seeing all the traditional methods that they use for harvest that have been handed down for thousands of years, and got to experience all the different butchering techniques and things like that. But then what really interested me was they said that if I wanted to see something cool, I could come back the next day and I could see polar bears and arctic foxes feeding on the leftover little remains. And as a middle school kid, um, the thought of seeing more polar bears was super interesting to me. So I jumped at the chance and my family went back out there the next day. But instead of polar bears and arctic foxes, what instead I saw was someone standing on top of a whale carcass with a chainsaw. Um, that completely threw me off guard. And it turned out that it was actually a whale biologist, a quite famous one, and he was taking samples. So little old me who had no idea what was going on, this biologist took the time and started showing me different parts of the whale. Uh, this is brain tissue, this is reproductive organ, this is stomach. And it completely blew my mind and changed my perspective almost that instant. And from that point on, I was very much interested in marine biology and that was the career path I wanted to pursue. And I wanted to be a biologist for NOAA was my now kid dream of my career. Um, and that actually started me down the path to where I am now working as a biologist for NOAA. Um, throughout high school, I uh, then started doing a bunch of any biology classes I could get my hand on, anything marine biology related. Um, and that all led to uh, actually an excellent internship opportunity that I had with the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program. They were able to get me an internship with NOAA at the Oak Creek Weir straight out of high school, um, right before I started my freshman year of college. Um, for those of you that are interested, the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program is for, or ANSEP, is for students all the way from elementary school through high school, and it's designed to foster students' um, interests in science, technology, engineering, and math. So if you have any interest in those, highly suggest checking out the program. They got me to where I am today, so they're there to help people in Alaska if you're here from here. Um, but then I got to go through this internship opportunity, um, and that's where my focus fully shifted from marine biology more directed down into fisheries. And I've actually been able to work at Oak Creek since that internship. Um, so it's a passion that led to an internship that actually led to a career. What of course followed to achieve that was a lot of school. Um, that's just kind of something that you're gonna have to go through. I wasn't the best of student, um, middle school, high school era. There was a lot of classes that I necessarily wasn't interested in. Um, but I found that once I got to college and I was able to take classes that were really interesting to me and directly focused on what I wanted to learn about, um, college years flew by for me and I ended up getting a bachelor's of science in marine biology followed by a master's in fisheries um, that I just graduated with from a couple years ago. Um, so school, it's just something you're gonna have to go through, but it's definitely worth it. And then what really set the focus for um, my career path was having excellent mentors. Here in this picture, you can see two of my current, um, my current boss and my previous boss, and I learned so much from them um, on a daily basis that I'm still learning from them. Um, and as well as so many excellent mentors that helped me along the way with teachers and everything that possibly helped me get to where I am. So I highly recommend pay attention to your teachers, listen to them, and um, they know a lot more than you do. And find yourself a good mentor who is interested in getting you to where you want. Because I know for me, um, now that I'm actually in my career, I take any opportunity like this to try to talk to kids who are coming up, try to figure out what they want to do. Because all of us scientists are we're passionate about what we do and we always want to share and want to help people. So there's no shortage of people who want to help mentor you, try to get to where you want to be in your career. And with that, I'll take a quick break for questions. Okay, um, sounds good, Josh. Thanks for all that background on, on your um, work. I do have a question of what is the biggest fish that you've ever caught? Because I see there in your questions picture, there's a huge salmon, I think it is. And so, I was, so we did get the question, what's the biggest fish you've ever caught since you're so um, interested in fishing? Uh, the biggest fish I ever caught was, it was a 36 inch king salmon, which is almost just slightly bigger than that picture there, which is what a fish that we got at the weir. But I caught a 36 inch, so just a three foot king salmon, which is probably about as tall as some of you elementary middle schoolers. 
<laughs> That's pretty cool. We do have some some um, classrooms online here. We've got Mrs. Hemphill's fourth grade class from Eagle River, um, and we've got um, a class from Lake Creek High School as well as well as Susan Smith's um, elementary class in Tacoma, Alaska. We do have a couple of other questions. Um, Jaden was wondering what's the rarest fish you've ever caught. Oh, um, the rare. Eh. Maybe it's just the rarest for me, but it was the picture you saw when I first um, first started the presentation of me fly fishing, and it was a it's a small fish, but it was a saltwater cutthroat. Which, if you're in Juneau, those are hard to find. And I got really lucky; it was actually one of my first times out fly fishing. I think it was beginner's luck, but managed to catch one. But some people spend years trying to catch one here. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, Carol had also wanted, uh, was wondering again, whether you could say again, how much that, how, how heavy that fish was that you caught and also uh, whether the fish that in the picture has teeth. Um, it fish weighed about, I believe it was just over 20 pounds or so. So a lot of big fish and a lot of meat. Um, and yes, the picture here, the, you can see that these fish, it's actually really interesting. We don't entirely know how they develop their teeth or the purpose for them to a point. Um, but when they're returning to fresh water to spawn, they do, the males and some of the females produce these large teeth, um, almost similar to canine teeth. And then they have little rows, but they don't actually use them for any sort of feeding. It's more for protection or for um, fighting off males for better mate selection. Cool. Um, Laura also had wanted to know what what is the favorite what is your favorite part of your job? Favorite part of my job, um, which I'll probably get into a little bit more, is that I get to work at the Oak Creek Weir, which is a full NOAA field site, but it's actually located in Juneau. So I get to be out in the field every single day, February through November. But sometimes the weir doesn't take all day, and then I can go to the lab. So my job is a perfect blend of I can be in the field every day, but then I can go out to the lab, I can do analysis, I can do research, and I can sleep in my bed every night. So it's almost like a biologist's dream setup for me, and that's what that's the thing I love most about it. Very cool. And Laura had wondered, um, what was your first job after graduate school? And um, you had mentioned that you went from an internship into, into a job at the Oak Bay Lab. And we were wondering whether that was directly there or whether you did anything in between. It was actually direct. So my kind of path was I started my summer before my freshman year of college. I got to work as an Oak Creek intern. Um, then all through college every summer, I worked there as an intern. Um, then through grad school, I started working full time as a NOAA independent contractor. So I wasn't a full employee, but I was working for them still full time. And then once I had my master's and had the proper qualifications, my first job was hired as a fisheries biologist for the Oak Creek Weir. So my wow. entire career path, that internship directly led me to my first job out of grad school. That's cool. And that and that also um, means that all of the years of experience that you put in as an intern and as, as a contractor contributed to um, your your knowledge of working at the lab at the weir there. Absolutely. I ended up being a fresh master's graduate with seven years of experience in my field, which helps tremendously for that job hiring process. That's great. So so Tavi, who's in third grade, wants to know if the salmon in the photo is a dog salmon. Um, close. It's a king salmon, actually. Um, but they're they're get, this is a very, as you can probably tell, very aged up king salmon. So they get kind of hard to distinguish. Right. And then um, last question before we get into your next section is that Laura was wondering, what's your favorite fish? I think I can guess, but I'm going to let you answer that. <laughs> um, actually, I don't have a picture of me with my favorite fish, but my favorite fish is the coho, um, mainly because I've done a lot of work on them. They're also my favorite to fish for, and I think they're the best tasting. So definitely coho salmon. Great. Well, let's get into your next section because I know that you have a lot to share with our, our viewers here. Fantastic. So my next section, I want to talk to you guys a bit about the life cycle of a salmon. So we're going to go through what the seven main life stages are, where they're 
currently at geographically in that life stage. Um, but before we get into that, there's a couple of key things that I want you to try to remember about salmon. Um, one is the word anadromous, um, which is basically a really fancy word that scientists have for saying that a fish starts its life cycle in freshwater, migrates to saltwater to mature, and then comes back to freshwater to spawn. So anadromous just means that it's a cycle, freshwater, saltwater, freshwater. Um, and one thing that's also important to realize about salmon, or what I'm going to be talking about today, or Pacific salmon, is that they only do this once. So they migrate as a juvenile out of freshwater, mature in saltwater, come back to fresh to spawn, and then they die. Um, there's other species of salmon, for example, the Atlantic salmon, um, that can do this multiple times. But we're going to focus today just on Pacific salmon, and for the specific life cycle, more on coho salmon, because it's a little more simplistic. So keep in mind that while we're talking about coho salmon in their life cycle, all the five different species of Pacific Northwest salmon have slight different changes. Some can be in freshwater longer or different, but focus on coho today because it's easier to do. Um, and the last important thing is that to remember that salmon, even though they go through this whole process and they're migrating from their stream where they grew up out to the Gulf of Alaska, all around BC, Western Alaska, and then back, they always return to their same stream, which is still to me as a biologist, I mean, I've known this for years, but it's still mind boggling to me that they can do that. And scientists still actually, we have kind of an idea of how they can migrate back to their mainstream, but we still don't fully understand it. And it's still kind of a mystery to us. Um, so that's one of the things that, so those are the three main things I guess I want you to remember anadromous, that they only do it once and that they can always return to the same stream. But to jump in, the first stage of the life cycle is when these salmon are as an egg. So as I go through each of these life cycles, there's gonna be a map on the left side of the screen. Um, you can see here, we have the greater Alaska area. We have more blown up of just Southeast Alaska. So this region down here. And then we have the watershed where I work at, which is Lake, Off Lake watershed. So we have Lake Creek, which feeds Off Lake which then flows downstream through Auk Creek, past the weir where I work, down to Auk Bay, which is the salt water. So that kind of helps you get an idea. And there'll be a star that moves around showing you where each stage of this life cycle is taking place. So for eggs, their entire life part of this life cycle is happening in the gravel in what are called reds. And this picture down here, you can see this discoloration in the gravel. And that is a salmon red that has been dug by a female or just basically a nest. So they'll use their bellies to dig into the gravel and they'll lay anywhere between 1,000 to 3,000 eggs, depending on the species. And this red can protect the salmon. So the water will flow, instead of just laying on top of the gravel, it's kind of compressed. So the water will flow over. That way the eggs don't get blown out of the water and get moved around. They can kind of stay there and stay protected and get nestled into the gravel. Um, they can stay in this stage as an egg where they're slowly maturing from around November, December um, up until February or March. So it can be four months or so that they're in this egg stage developing. The next stage after this is what is called an elven life stage. Um, again, this is still in the same spot in where for Lake Creek or for feeding streams. And this is what an alevin looks like. It looks like you can kind of see that it looks a little bit like a salmon, but it still has its yolk sac attached. So it's still, it's not feeding on its own and it's not strong enough to swim. So it's currently still down in the same gravel of the red and it is focused on absorbing that yolk sac to feed and get itself stronger so that it can swim. After this life stage, it moves on to what is called a fry. And this is where it starts to look most like a baby salmon. Um, it's able to fully swim on its own. And as you'll notice, that yolk sac is gone. And they've now moved, they've started moving around a little bit. So these fry will come out of the gravel and they'll start moving into what we call um, protected areas, basically. So they'll be in woody debris on the sides of the creeks behind big rocks where, because they're not super big and they're not strong swimmers, they will hide behind like a rock, dart out, grab a piece of food and come back and hide. Um, and they'll spend a bit of their life cycle like this, where they're just opportunistically trying to get whatever food is available to them so that they can get bigger and stronger. And this change from egg to elven to fry um, can happen over about a month to two month period. Um, from this stage, they move on to what is called a par. And a par is where salmon juveniles spend 
most of their life stage. And for coho, that can be anywhere between one to two years. Um, don't ask me why they go anywhere, but they can migrate at one year or two years old. We still don't know. Um, but they spend that time as a par. Um, they develop what are called and where they get their name, these football or oval shaped markings called par markings. And coho get some of the more distinguishing features at this time, which are the white leading edge on their fins and the more brownish ruddy, fin, ruddy red fin color um, that helps us identify them as coho. And now they've moved out of these lake creek protected environments into Auk Lake. And they've entered the full water column of Auk Lake. So they're moving up and down in the water column, feeding depending on day and night cycles, um, growing bigger, stronger, and they're spending that one to two year period here trying to get bigger. After they spend that one to two year period, they then turn into what is called a smolt. Um, as you can see, the main difference between a par and a smolt is they get a little bit bigger because they've had that one or two years to grow. And then their scale color changes. So here they're a little more silvery, whereas previously you can see the full color of the fish. Um, what that is, and it's where they get their name, is they've gone through a process called smoltification, which this basically means that they've matured as much as they can in fresh water and they're ready to go to salt water but their body has to go through a lot of different changes. So they're going from living in just fresh water to salt water, which requires complete changes in a lot of their body chemistry and things like that. And one of the things that happens from that process is that their scales get this silvery color, um, which is basically the scales thickening and hardening to protect themselves from the harsher marine environment, as well as they start getting a mucus layer that covers themselves to help protect them. Um, when they're in this smolt stage, they will migrate out of Auk Lake, where they spent that one to two year period, um, down Auk Creek, where we'll do a little bit of sampling with them for science work at the weir, and then they migrate into what we call the near shore environment. So they're in what we refer to in Alaska as the inside passage, and they'll stay in this near shore environment for a month or so, where they start getting access to a lot better food resources that they didn't have in freshwater. So at this stage in their life cycle, these fish are about three or four inches. So maybe for those of you in school, about, about the size of your palm, for me, it's a little smaller. Um, they'll go from that to a full size adult. So two, two and a half feet in about six months. So they're going from something this to this in a very short amount of time. So they're getting, they're eating constantly, putting on as much weight and as much size as they can because that helps them better survive. So they, like I said, they go from this to this in that short amount of time. And these are what most people would recognize as a full coho salmon or silver, large, bright, super dime bright silver. And these are found out here in the Gulf of Alaska. So these fish will move out of the inside passage or the near shore environment to the full Gulf of Alaska. They'll do one big circuit on their way back. Um, this is the point in their life cycle where they are most vulnerable to all the different methods of commercial fishery harvest, um, which we'll go into a little bit more. Um, this is also where they're most susceptible to predators. Um, so be it humans and be it other animals, they're actually they're running a gauntlet trying to get back. Um, once they decide to start that process coming back, we refer to them as a spawning adult, which is what you can see here. Um, and just like when they got those silvery scales going from a par to a smolt, now when they're going from an adult to a spawning adult, they start developing this deep red color, um, almost a green back, and they develop that kipe that you see here. So it's just a hooked nose and mouth. And they also start developing more pronounced teeth like we saw in that king salmon. And these fish have come back from the Gulf of Alaska. They've migrated through the Oak Creek Weir, which is where we'll do processing and sampling. And then they try to get basically as far up Lake Creek as they can to lay their eggs um, and they die. So, and then the process starts all over again. So this whole process from laying their eggs to growing up, um, migrating all the way throughout the Gulf of Alaska, way over to Western Alaska and back can be anywhere between three to four years. So they've been on quite a journey um, and it's still mind-boggling to me how they can do this and how they're so efficient at it. And it's one of the things that's great about salmon. Any questions? 
Okay, well, that that was really fascinating to see the changes in the stages of the salmon as they grow. Um, we did have a couple of questions. Carol was wondering, after laying eggs in November and December, does the Lake Creek freeze for the winter, and and how does that how does that weather affect the eggs? Um, Lake Creek can freeze, and there are definitely a lot of salmon streams where they completely freeze over. Um, but one of the great things about that is the lake or the creeks don't freeze solid. It's just a layer of ice on top of the river. So for the most part, the eggs are pretty well protected and the water's flown and not much changes for them throughout the winter. Great, and for those of you who were um, watching our webinar series back in um, February, we did have a webinar series on salmon in the winter. So if you're curious about that, you can go back to our NOAA Live Alaska web webpage and see the recording for that. Um, Hannah was wondering, what do salmon eat? Salmon eat a lot of different things. So in freshwater, they're eating pretty much anything they can get a hold of. Um, mainly that can be um, what are called, we call them dipterans, but they're basically like small little water bugs. So if you've ever um, gotten to see water under a microscope, you see a lot of things that are swimming around and crawling. Um, basically salmon are eating whatever they can get a hold of there. And then when they migrate out to the salt water, they are eating a lot of zooplankton and phytoplankton. So a lot of the things, same things that you think of, of whales eating, um, salmon are eating the same things. Um, when they're out there, they can eat things that are maybe about, about that big um, in size. So about the length of my finger. So they can eat quite a bit. They're also eating other smaller salmon. Um, but then, like I said, in the marine environment, there's so many more better food sources for them. And that's why they can put on so much weight. Great, and in a related way, like back to our, our question about spawning, um, Tavi had wanted to know what happens if the, if the salmon don't spawn? Can they stay out in the ocean for longer? Um, that is a great question. And that is one of the things that where it can be more, it depends on the species. So for coho, or at least for all of our coho, they immediately, they'll spend that one winter or one year out there and they come back. But there are species, um, for example, the sockeye can spend anywhere between two to three years out in the ocean. Again, we don't know what drives them to come back after two years or three. Um, and then you can have things like the chinook or the king salmon that can go up to six years out in the ocean. So it depends on when they're feeling like coming back and when they feel they have a best chance of spawning. But for coho, they will pretty much always, they'll either not survive to return or they'll return after that one year. Got it. Um, Carol was also wondering whether there were some that don't go into the salt water at all, but stay in fresh water. <laughs> um, that's, this is where it starts getting complicated. There are some very rare cases of that happening um, where we call them um, resident salmon or residualized or kokanee. Um, and they'll actually, we do have evidence of that in Oak Creek where we have kokanee sockeye. Um, that can stay in there. They, we believe they're viable for spawning, um, that they can successfully spawn, but they actually only get about that big. They don't grow a lot. So um, for example, like for females or something, the larger the fish you have, the larger the fish, the more eggs there are in general. Um, so they're not, it's not a super successful um, strategy for them. We call them all these different methods of salmon life cycles, we call different life history strategies. So that kokanee or residualized salmon is not a very successful life history, but it is one that exists. Got it. I had no idea that that uh, kokanee salmon um, were up in, in the Oak Creek area. So that's interesting. I've heard of them in other areas down here in the Pacific Northwest. So that's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, they're very... We haven't been, it's hard for us to study them in the freshwater because we can't, um, it's hard to get access at them because they don't pass past the weir. So it's just been over the years, we occasionally can see one, but it's very, very small numbers. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. Anna Maria was wondering, why is the spawning adult red and green while the other kinds are silver or gray? 
uh, that is again a fantastic question. Um, so it depends on where in the life cycle that you catch the salmon. So in the ocean, they're very that silvery color. Um, when they're getting ready to come back into freshwater, a lot of salmon will completely change colors. So for pinks, that's where they get their name. They get more of a pink spotted color. Um, sockeye are known for their famous the sockeye reds and the greens. Um, but what that's what's causing that is as the fish comes back to saltwater or comes back to freshwater, they're devoting all of their body and food and energetics and resources into preparing themselves to have to again live in freshwater and to make the migration for Auk Creek. It's not that far. Um, they only have to go maybe a mile upstream, but there are some species of salmon like Chinook on the Yukon that they're going to be migrating thousands of miles back to their native stream where they'll come in and Bristol Bay, Alaska, go through all of Alaska into Canada to spawn. Um, so they're developing all those resources to go in there. And what happens as a result of that is um, you start seeing the, they put them into their muscle, so they don't work on developing that um, coating on the scales that you see. So you actually start, the red color you see is the color of the meat coming through that you're seeing through the scales. Um, and then the reason you start seeing that color turn to a grayish, brownish color later in the year is, or later throughout their migration, is that their meat quality is degrading because they're putting everything into muscle and their reproductive organs to spawn. So that's, you're actually seeing kind of the meat start to decay as they go from that bright, vibrant red showing their good quality meat to lower quality later into this later into their migration we have a couple of comments that that uh people hunter was amazed to, to think um he couldn't imagine traveling over a thousand miles to get home and <laughs> um yeah it's it's amazing to think that these these um fish are traveling that far yeah it's especially those salmon that do the yukon migration because if you think about it they're migrating to somewhere in the Yukon portion of Canada, when they enter the Yukon Delta in Alaska, there's no way that they can any way smell or sense where their natal stream is. And they'll migrate all the way along the Yukon through, there's thousands of different turns that they can take, but they always make it back to the exact stream where they respond in. That's pretty amazing. Um, we have a couple other questions. Um, so Mabel and Ruby from Arizona were wondering what predators eat salmon eggs? Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, one of the main things that can eat salmon eggs in our system are another fish, which is called sculpin. Um, they're kind of kind of ugly, but kind of cute little fish. Um, and they, one of their main food resources is eating those salmon eggs. Additionally, there are Dolly Varden and cutthroat trout, which are smaller fish. And there's actually been some studies done at Oak Creek in a process that we called synchrony, in that as the we see that the salmon will migrate in and then quickly after all the dollies and trout follow because they're there to eat all those eggs and food resources. And additionally, there are some birds that can eat salmon eggs, um, a lot of seagulls, sometimes ducks as well, and waterfowl. Great. And then going to the other end of the food chain, um, Carol was wondering, what are the predators of the big salmon, like the one that you were holding in the last question slide? Definitely. Um, some of their main predators, we've seen evidence of killer whales predating on them, as well as sea lions, um, and then as well the salmon shark. That is uh, it's one of their main food resources is salmon. And then probably their their definite biggest predator of the adult salmon is us as humans catching them as a food resource. Right, and having them on your dinner plate. Exactly. And then last last question before we go to the next section. Um, Melissa was wondering how long can salmon live? And you touched on this a little bit earlier when you were talking about the different kinds of salmon and how they have, and some have different lengths of cycles, but I was wondering whether you could go that, over that again. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I would say the shortest period would be for pink salmon, which they don't go through the smultification process. They actually migrate out to the ocean as fry. So for our fish, they would come back total age as a two-year-old. 
Um, and then the potentially the oldest that you could see would be um, if they stayed in fresh water, the longest amount of time and the ocean, the longest amount of time would be kings that can go up to around eight years. So there's a lot of variation depending on what species that you're looking at. And then sockeye, coho, and um, chum fall kind of in the middle there with different strategies. Great. Well, thanks. And let's go into our next section because I know you have a lot more to share with us. Fantastic. So now I want to talk to you guys about what is a weir. Um, some of you guys might have seen these before. Um, this is just a weir that's used by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game that's designed to block fish passage. At its basis, a weir is just there to either stop or capture fish. Um, this is a picket weir, so it has just a core of spikes that are driven down into the creek bed, and there's cross supports, and then they just put a bunch of pickets over that are just close enough together that a fish can't pass through it. Um, so if a fish was coming, so this water is flowing this direction, so this is downstream, um, they'd come up, hit the weir, can't go anywhere. So this would be used, for example, if there was a large hatchery program and they wanted to stop fish from getting into a new system. Um, that way they can protect the native systems. Um, but weirs are used for a lot of different things as well. So like I said, at its core, uh, a weir is simply a method for fish capture. So this is another Alaska Department of Fish and Game, or ADF&G, um, fish weir. Fish will migrate upstream, they'll nose along the weir, trying to figure out where they can go. Um, one thing that's miraculous about salmon is they're, when they're in fresh water as an adult, they're very cute into flow. So they are excellent at finding the most efficient way up a stream. You probably have seen videos of salmon that are jumping up waterfalls and um, all the different things. So that flow super keys them in. So they have this capture spot here right at the top of the weir. So the fish will nose along trying to find the best flow. They'll get in here. Biologists can then get in there. We can take samples, um, do whatever we need to do. And then we can release them on their merry way upstream to continue their migration. So at its basis, it's just a method for fish capture. Um, one thing that I find super interesting is that weirs have been around for a very long time. Um, and I'm talking thousands to tens of thousands of years. Weirs have, or evidence of weirs have been found in many different cultures all around the world from England, Ireland, Scandinavia, um, Central Europe, down in um, the Philippines over to down in Central and South America, as well as probably some of the cultures that are most well known for it are those of the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest that kind of have evidence of being some of the oldest weirs. Um, actually, these, this picture here is from a remains of an old weir um, that was from the early 1800s, which was just simple stacked stones on a riverbed that would force fish through a specific choke point where the fish could be caught. And this is evidence actually of a old Cherokee weir in um, southeastern, the southeastern United States, um, which was just simple stacked stones on each side of the riverbed. The fish would migrate through here, pass a trap, and then they could be captured. Um, and these are these examples are hundreds of years old, but actually there's been evidence off by the University of Canada um, off the coast of BC. Um, I found they found about 120 feet underwater, but due to recent sea level rises, um, they found evidence of what appears to be an ancient weir that's about 14,000 years old. So actually some of the oldest man-made structures that we've found have been weirs, which is kind of cool. Because if you think about it, that long ago, all these cultures, they couldn't travel, they couldn't talk or communicate to each other. But tens, 20s, 30 different cultures all came up with the same method of fish capture because it is so efficient. Um, some of the earliest actual like evidence that we see or recordings of fisheries management um, um, one of that we saw was the King of England banned the use of rears um, around London because they were too efficient at catching fish. Some of the first fisheries management was no more using weirs, they're too effective, we're gonna destroy the populations. And that's why even to this day, except for in some specific subsistence use, you around the world, you don't really see fish weirs used because they can completely harvest an entire migrating population, which means the next year there won't be any fish. Um, but 
At its base, weirs can come in many different shapes and sizes. Here is, a, again, a more traditional picket weir, but this one's actually made completely out of log and timber and sticks, um, even down to old ancient weirs where they would just find a narrow part of the stream and they would just stick tree sticks or limbs into the creek bed at a very narrow point to capture fish as they migrate and pass. So there's a lot of different ways you can make a weir, um, but they all do about the same thing. And, but for me, where I work at a weir, we're actually borrowing this very ancient technology for modern science, because even though it's been thousands of years, we still haven't found a better way of catching fish for this method. So here you see the Oak Creek Weir, which looks pretty similar, just instead of steel pickets, we're using I-beams and steel plates, um, mainly because this weir where I work at has been in full-time operation February through November since 1980. So we need something that's a little stronger, can hold up to the environment, but at its basis, it's still just a weir face that fish can move up downstream and they can move over here is the only spot that's open, which moves them into this capture pin, where then we as biologists can get in, we can take whatever samples that we need to do um, or for any research projects that we're working on. So it's kind of cool that we're using this ancient technology still today. Um, where I work is the Oak Creek Research Station, which is located in Juneau, Alaska. And like I said, it's been in full-time operation for going on 42 years now. Um, and one thing that's interesting about our weir is this is what I've shown you pictures of, that this is a traditional capturing fish that are moving upstream. But one thing that's nice about Oak Creek is we can actually flip the structure and change its infrastructure around to actually catch fish that are migrating downstream. So instead of catching adults, we're catching pink fry that are maybe about the size of the tip of your finger and that way maybe about the same as four or five grains of rice so we're capturing everything and because of the way of the weir that's designed we can actually capture every single migrating fish that goes both upstream and downstream so that makes Oak creek one of the only weirs in the world that has a hundred percent accounting of every single fish that moves through it um, which is gives some power to some of the research that we can do because instead of having estimates of fish, we actually know how many fish should move through. And at its basis of its core of what happens on a daily basis at Oak Creek is counting of every single fish. So every fish, whether it's the tiny pink fry, which I think as of today, we're up to 13,000 have migrated this year. I've looked at every single one or handled every single one as we count them out and let them go about their way. Um, then turning again on the adult capture, we're handling, physically picking up and handling every fish, taking lengths and weights and scale samples and genetic samples from these fish. So it's, it's a lot of counting, but it's a lot of work. But luckily, Oak Creek has just about the right population size that it's not oppressive trying to count every single fish. Um, but like I said, we sample a small portion of all these fish. We shoot for around a 10% sampling rate. So we're taking everything from lengths, weights, we take scale samples, which was for some of my research. Um, we take genetic samples so that we can look at um, potentially what species is doing best, what family groups are doing best. And sometimes we're also doing a lot of different research projects and we'll take different samples as we can. So that's one thing that Oak Creek, because we can count every fish, a lot of different researchers come to us to try to test their theories and research because we have a perfect place for doing so. Additionally, one thing that we do at Oak Creek is we tag all of our coho smolts that migrate out. So we place what's called a coated wire tag, which is a tag that's about as long of a grain, as a grain of rice and maybe as thick around as maybe two or three strands of hair. So it's really small, really fine. And we insert it right in the tip of their nose and it has no effect on them, doesn't bother them. We anesthetize them so that they're asleep during the process. Um, so it's at no harm to them. And we take off one of their extra fins, which is their adipose fin. What that allows us to do is as those fish mature and they're caught in different fisheries, no matter if it's in Washington, Canada, way out in Alaska, they'll see that that fin is missing and they'll know that fish has been tagged. So they can, the fish is being taken for harvest anyway, so it's been killed. So they'll take the head and they can retrieve that tag and it has a six digit code on it that refers back to Oak Creek. So no matter where our fish are caught, we know where they were caught and in what fisheries they were caught. So all that information comes together in that we know how many fish went out, we know how many came back, and we know how many were caught in the fisheries. 
So it allows us to do some really cool research because again, we're not dealing with estimates, we're dealing with exact numbers. And by looking at that, we can see potentially, are they doing worse in the freshwater period, worse in the marine period, where maybe just more fish caught in the fisheries that year. And it allows us to actually look at that. And then over a 40 year time period, we can actually make some pretty strong observations on how salmon are doing. Um, and it gives, this information then goes to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, which they use to set management strategies for the different species of salmon based on how our fish are doing. Additionally, like I said, there's a lot of different salmon research that goes on. Um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the research that I did for my master's project, which was looking at changes in growth and survival of coho salmon. Um, one thing that's really cool about salmon is that they have interesting structures on their scales. And I don't know if you're familiar with tree rings, but tree rings basically, if you were to cut a tree down and look at the stump, on the surface of the stump, there are different rings. And for each ring, that's a year that the tree has been alive. Salmon actually do something very similar. Like you can see here in this picture, there's all these different rings, which we call circuli. The only difference with salmon is that they put down multiple circuli in a year. So for example, this coho is three years old, but there's a lot more than three circuli. Um, but what's cool about these circuli is how far apart they're spaced shows how much the fish was growing. So you can see here, this is actually their freshwater zone. So as you can imagine, that was a small fish. They haven't grown a ton, even over two years. So this would be two years, and then this section would be one year. Um, but the circuli are really close together. And then you see right when they migrate out to freshwater as a small, these rings start putting down a lot and they're really wide space. So this is actually that first summer of growth for the fish. And then you see they start getting a little closer together. This is winter, so not as many food resources available for them in winter because of temperature and different things. And then you see the next summer where they migrate are starting to come back to Oak Creek. They again get that large growth, summer growth. And then this would be where they would be, this last circuli is where they'd be captured at Oak Creek and we'd take that scale. So by looking at this, and then we've taken samples at Oak Creek over the 40 year time period, we can look and see was winter growth stronger last year than it has been on average, or what years did, like if fish did really well in 2020, we could see maybe their summer growth was better, or maybe their winter growth. And it allows us to basically have a roadmap of what a salmon's growth was like throughout the entire history by just taking one scale, and then we have it across 40 years. So it allows us to have some really good archives of what salmon have been, been through over that time period. And again, any questions? Um, actually, one of the questions that just came out was that Michelle was wondering, how do you spell circulate? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my spelling is horrible. Uh, C-I-R-C-U-L-I. L-I, okay, because she was wondering whether it was an A-E at the end. Um, so um, one of the questions that, um, Let's see, I was looking for Mabel and Ruby. Mabel and Ruby were wondering, how can the, how can the little coho swim if you've cut one of their fins off? Um, that's a great question. So let's see, might have to go back a little ways. Um, but if you remember the photo I showed of a salmon par, actually, let me quickly go find it. It'll be easier to show you. Um, so here's that picture again of a salmon par, or I can actually show you better on a smolt. Um, they have a lot of different fins. So this is their dorsal fin, adipose, um, this is their caudal fin, and then they have pectoral, pelvic, and anal fin. So they have a lot of different fins. Um, these fins are mainly used for swimming, this is used for stabilization in the water, and then this is used for their main propulsion. The fin that we take off is their adipose fin back here, which is a fin that they don't really use. It doesn't serve them any purpose. So we can easily remove that without harming the fish. It doesn't have any impact on their survival. Um, but then it's a great marker for fisheries biologists to see that and be able to know that that fish has been tagged. So just a really convenient way to mark them that has no effect on them. Great. Um, and then Mrs. Helmhill's class, uh, from Eagle Creek, Eagle River was wondering what is the white stuff that was on the scale that you showed where you were looking at the circuli on the scale? 
uh, this area here. I'm yeah, guessing. I think that's. Yeah, um, I think that's that area mean. is. So the scales, you can kind of think about it like a feather on a bird. So there's a bunch of feathers that like would overlap over each other. It's the same for scales. So this area is just where it's attached to the fish. Okay, great. And I know that we have about 11, 10 minutes left. So I'll just ask one more question. Um, Tavi had wanted to know how many salmon do you typically, typically tag in a day? Um, luckily at Oak Creek, it is not a ton of fish. Um, so at Oak Creek, a big day for us would be a couple of thousand fish, and that would be a really big day. But there are some systems elsewhere that do the same tagging process. They can tag 10,000 fish in a day. So we have it pretty easy at Oak Creek. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, I'll let you get into your last section here. Perfect. Um, so moving on to my last section here, I want to talk to you guys just a little bit about salmon management. So all the different um, salmon catch methods that happen in Alaska, how we manage for that. And then finally, a little bit about stewardship and how we can be more responsible in our protecting salmon and also our catching of salmon. So we avoid situations here where we get sea lions caught up in fishing line. Um, before I get into salmon management, I have another key thing that I want you to remember, and that is that salmon are a keystone species. Um, to describe what a keystone species is, I want to first describe what a keystone is. So a keystone is this, if you're building a stone archway, and this was a technique that was used way back in the Roman era, but if you're building a stone archway and you start stacking stones up, these stones will sit on top of each other just fine. But as you start adding stones on this arch, if this stone wasn't here, these stones would fall down because there's nothing for, to support them because they just slide at an angle. So um, stonemasons would put in what is called a keystone at the top of the arch that all the forces of the stones on the edge would push against so the arch would stay up. So without this keystone, the entire archway would collapse. We can then draw that parallel over to salmon. Salmon are a keystone species on which the rest of the ecosystem is reliant upon. So if salmon were removed, we'd see large impacts to our ecosystem. So salmon are a keystone species that are used by many other predators and for many other things. So for example, like we talked about earlier, um, there are other fish and waterfowl that depend on salmon eggs for a food resource for them. Um, there are whales and sea lions that, and salmon sharks that eat them as a food resource. Um, there's us as well. We depend on salmon. Salmon fisheries are some of the largest, most productive fisheries in the world. And in Alaska, we have, I think, two of the five largest salmon fisheries. Um, additionally, there's something that a lot of people don't realize, and that is that actually the dead carcass of the salmon is an incredibly nutrient-rich source of um, different things for plants. So you'll actually see what we call marine derived nutrients. So when that salmon comes back, spawns and dies, its body decomposes and those nutrients are used by trees. And you'll actually see, especially if you're in, ever in Southeast Alaska, our trees are massive down here. And you'll see that trees are taller, healthier, um, have more growth, the closer they are to a salmon stream. And then all those different features decrease the farther away you get from that salmon stream. So those marine derived nutrients are also big and something that a lot of people don't realize. So all of those different things are reliant on salmon, which makes them that keystone species. And because of that, it's really important that we manage them properly because if we don't, we can't eat salmon or bears won't be able to. It has a lot of impacts if we as humans improperly manage our catch of them. So one of the first of the three main types of salmon harvest that accounts for most of um, the catch is that of commercial salmon. And commercial salmon is accounts for about 9.9 .9 billion pounds of salmon caught every year. And I know to me that's a completely mind boggling number. Um, but if you think about, uh, if you guys have ever gone on vacation and taken a flight on a 737 jet, if you took Every single jet 737 that has been built since they were since they first started being built to modern day, that doesn't even and weight all of them, that doesn't even add up to 9.9 .9 billion pounds. And yet we're harvesting that many salmon 
do commercial harvest every single year. So there's millions and millions of salmon that are being caught every year for this commercial harvest. Um, so as a result, and because they're keystone species, we have to make sure that we do that responsibly. And that's something that's amazing about salmon is that we can catch sometimes over 50% of the salmon that are migrating um, uh, catch 50% of a resource and it's still sustainable. So that's what makes salmon great about what they are. Um, additionally, there is, so commercial harvest was people going out and catching large amounts of fish from like and money. Sport fishing is like you and I, we go out with our rods or, or on our personal boats trying to catch what fish we can. Um, sport fishing is the second largest catch of salmon. It doesn't account for a ton but with Alaska's um, like charter fishing and industries and whatnot, there's still quite a bit that's accounted for. And it's important that we keep track of that to see where these fish are being used. And finally, the smallest, but still probably one of the most important um, methods of harvest is that of subsistence. And that is for indigenous peoples in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest to be able to catch salmon from their ancestral rivers, like their ancestors have done for thousands of years and to have that important food resource. So all these three different types of harvests come together that as biologists, we try to manage, for one, we manage for the salmon to make sure that they're sustainable, that they're gonna keep coming back year after year after year. But then we're also trying to manage and make sure that commercial fishermen have enough fish to pay their bills and provide for the family and that sport fishermen can go out and that sport fishing industry stays alive. And as well, importantly, that there's food for subsistence use. So there's a lot of different things that we're trying to manage for and why we do all this research and try to keep track of what's going on with them and to understand how they're being affected by the environment um, so that we can properly manage for these things. Um, now I want to just jump into a little bit to finish off on salmon stewardship and what can you do in your daily life, especially if you live in Alaska or if you're not in Alaska, these are things that um, would expand out to other fishing or being good stewards of your marine environment. So main thing you can do, that's the easiest one that you have to do anyway, is obey your fishing regulations. This is a document that's put out every year by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, this one specifically for Southeast Alaska, that goes over all the different changes to regulations in the last year, as well as what the current, like how big of a fish you can take, how many you can take. And it's really important to pay attention to these because some years, we might as biologists decide that a population that you might have been fishing for four or five years, it's not doing super well. So we're gonna close it for a year to give those salmon a chance to recuperate. And that's where you'd find this information. So be knowledgeable about your fishing regulations and then obey them. Oops. Um, next thing you can do is try to protect your salmon rivers or expanding out to other fish rivers. Um, one of the main things that you can do is when you're out hiking or whatnot, stay on the trails. Um, if you're trying to climb on the edge of the riverbank, you can destroy vegetation, which will lead to more erosion. Um, additionally, one of the most important things for salmon when they're freshwater is the most valuable thing for them is shade. And if we start destroying, knocking over trees, taking out plants, they lose a lot of that shade and it heats up the creek, which is harder for them to survive. So trying to protect your salmon rivers is super important. Um, another thing that you can do is watch out for the reds. And the reds we talked about a little bit before, which are those salmon nests. Um, here you can see in the picture, each red is marked with a red dot. And you can see that red's just gonna have that discoloration that can be anywhere between a foot to almost three foot in diameter. Um, so watch out for those because in general, like I said, there can be anywhere between 1,000 to 3,000 eggs. But if survivors, surviving of those eggs is really good and they survive to be a par, to a small, to come back as an adult, we'd be lucky if about 1%, 1 to 5% of those 1 to 3,000 eggs survive. So if you put your boot in the middle of it, that number goes way down. So really watch out for those reds, learn to identify them. They're pretty easy to watch for just by the discoloration. So try to not step on those. Um, additionally, don't leave your fishing line out. I know it's tempting when you're fishing sometimes to, um, you get a knot in your line and you just want to throw it down, but make sure you put it in your pockets so you don't end up in situations like this where you end up with sea lions that have salmon fishing tackle caught on their mouth because then that can either lead to their death or biologists have to quickly fly out there and tranquilize the animal, which leads to stressing it out to try to remove that gear. So 
be really responsible with your fishing gear and we can avoid those situations. Additionally, one not a lot of people think about is avoid putting pollutants in storm drains. Um, a lot of times in the Pacific Northwest, you'll see these storm drains with signs of no dump waste drains to stream, um, where these storm drains, they're designed to just pick up water runoff and then they dump into fresh water or out into the ocean. Um, but if you're washing your car with harsh chemicals and then you just think you'll wash it out in the street, that's putting those harsh chemicals directly out into salmon streams in the marine environment. So trying to be cognizant of that and to not introduce more than we need to into our streams can make a huge help. And then finally, a thing that you can always do, that there's always groups, whether it be NOAA, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, or tons of individual agencies all around the nation and the world have programs to, but where you can volunteer to help restore wetlands and rivers. Um, there's things for everyone from elementary school to as old as you want that can go out there and help. They'll have gear for you and you'll be doing things of removing blockages to fist passage, um, removing trash from rivers, tons of different things that really help protect and restore our wetlands and rivers. And those are things that are super important that you can do to help and anyone can do. So with that, I'll end up on any other questions. Well, I think we are just about out of time, so I don't think we'll be able to take any questions, but I wanted to thank you very much, Josh, for sharing all that information. Super interesting stuff. Um, and we we had a lot of questions about um, the salmon life cycle and um, things about your job. And so I really appreciate you taking the time and talking with us. Absolutely. I was, like I said, I I we love what we do and we love to talk about it. And we always love to, help out people that we can with who are interested in what we do. So we always love to talk about it. Great. And thank you all to our viewers for tuning in. And um, we're back on our weekly schedule. So we'll be back next week to talk about river breakup in Alaska and what happens when the ice breaks up. So um, thank you very much for tuning in and we will see you next week, hopefully.